You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 126, Tomas Linkovicus on Zero Bone Loss Concepts. Tomas Linkovicus joins John and Wes this week to discuss the book Zero Bone Loss Concepts. You guys know it. We've been covering this book for the last few months, and it is a pleasure to have Tomas on to discuss how this book came about, and we even talk about what's in the book and some of the concepts surrounding the books and interestingly enough Tomas has taken it to the next level and now is providing online CE surrounding this book you're going to love this one this week on the dental guys looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science check out the dental crafters network dental crafters one relationship infinite possibilities Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. This is Justin Goodbrand and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. As we continue to look at ways to grow the value of your practice, we're going to talk a little bit more about financial concepts. Look, let's be honest, finance is tough, even for those with finance degrees. This is precisely why I recommend you find a good planner to help you. I began Financially Simple because I wanted to help make business concepts simple. And after 26 years of owning companies, I know how confusing finances can be. For example, did you calculate the hurdle rate needed on that recent piece of equipment you purchased? Probably not. Should you buy that new CT machine or are you being sold by a product manufacturer? Questions like these prove how hard finances are for many. If finances challenge you or if you have questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Just Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And Wes, we have been thinking about this one for a long time. Since long probably time. 2011. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of years back. I mean, we've had discussions after discussions about uh, this author going back long before his Mm. book was published. And, you know, after uh, doing, you know, spending several shows discussing this book, um, it's it's a real it's a real honor to have to have him here. So let's let's bring him in. Uh, Dr. Tomas Lingovicius, welcome to the Dental Guys. Hello. Hi, guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming uh, on the show. Really, really, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being yeah, here. This is a real honor. Yeah. Introduce me like as if I am being very old. <laughs> 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 yeah. That is, we, that is true. We shouldn't throw the We dates heard out, him we? for 10 years and now he's here. <laughs> uh, honestly. Yeah. I well, mean, I mean, we're all in the same boat. I mean, we're, we're now. We're as we're teaching people, as I know you're teaching. We're going to talk about that later in the show. As we're now <laughs> at the point in our careers, including you, uh, where we're starting to teach more, mm. it's interesting because now you start to feel a little older. You know, <laughs> as you see, like you're hopefully not the, wiser. the new clinician anymore. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. It, it's a strange you thing know, to feel that way because when you said older and wiser, sometimes years come by themselves. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> very yeah. true. Very true. Very true. But it's funny yeah. now to have people uh, look back, to look back at, you know, what you, because I mean, just a few years ago, I'm sure you were in the same boat of just taking in uh, information. And that's actually a great way to kind of start the show because, mm. you know, you've now come full circle from taking in information, studying, 
uh, information and trying to make some conclusions to then putting that together into this book, which, which, uh, you know, I think a lot of people that are watching this would say that it's really changed a lot about how we look at uh, implant dentistry in, in a way that has put together really information that's already out there. But the interesting thing about this book is that a lot of the data, <clears throat> especially in some of the earlier chapters and uh, the later chapters as well, comes from your studies, comes from, from things that you were looking at starting years ago. And I, I wonder if you could tell us and tell our listeners the kind of the story of how this book came to be. Um, you know, we look back at your research from a few years ago and we see that you develop this interest in uh, soft tissue thickness, for instance, and you, some interest also in cement. Um, and what we want to know <clears throat> is why did you start looking at that? What, what was it? Because at the time, people in especially the implant industry were very focused on connection and platform shifting and surface design. And not a lot of people, really maybe very few, were talking about mm. this soft tissue thickness being the thing that would influence bone loss. Uh, and I know that's just one factor, but mm -hmm. what got you thinking that way? And how did that start leading toward you know, this book coming to be? Yeah, so uh, let me in first uh, tell, uh, say thank you to you uh, about uh, your podcast you did about my book. And it was really funny. Uh, I think somebody from US emailed me and said, Thomas, look, these guys are talking about your book. And uh, I listened to a few of the series and, you know, it was like, Wow, did I read? Did I wrote that? I mean, <laughs> you, you are discussing. It was like a very interesting experience, you know. And in some places, I really meant different thing. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> good, okay. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so if we would start from the beginning, um, like uh, uh, it's interesting story, like. Always, there is a story behind some 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 book or some event or some some something. So I remember that uh, actually uh, I got interested in crystal bone stability already in two thousand and four, when I was postgraduate resident in prosthetic dentistry, and I remember that my supervisor gave me the task. Actually, so what factors are responsible for crystal bone stability? So you see, it's almost 20 years. I'm now actually working on this task, which I received uh, in 2004. And I remember looking at different factors, like again, similar, like there was no platform switching then. It was like micro gap and, and polished neck. These things have been known for many years. And I, I remember kind of bumped on the Berglund and Linter paper uh, from, from 1996, which actually was the first paper in animal study to discuss tissue thickness, that vertically we must also look at this uh, before implant surgery. And I started immediately looking at, so are there any clinical studies? And I found that there were none. And for me, somehow it was like really obvious that, you know, so uh, if, if, if tissues have different thickness, then they might have explained things which we can now, now can explain, but could not explain 15 years ago. Like, I think that uh, this all unexplained bone loss, which usually we attribute it to compression or to other things, actually were coming from tissue thickness. But the problem was that we did not really evaluate it. There was nothing like, you know, that in your protocol evaluate, to evaluate tissue thickness. We, we've been evaluating bone width, bone height, but no tissue thickness. So that was actually the, my PhD studies uh, topic. Uh, and uh, we did, I, I, Almost 2006, I think we started this clinical study, placing two implants in a different position and in uh, different soft tissue thickness. And then, yeah, 
we got the results. We published it 2009. In 2010, I published the same paper only with platform switching. That it also platform switching doesn't stop the bone. Uh, but like I don't know what I've been expecting. But like for three years there was n- nothing. I mean from the from the doctors or from the conferences. And I don't know. Maybe I was expecting something too much. But imagine like in 2011, I thought that actually this was not a good topic. And I kind mm. of pushed it aside. I put it mm. to the drawer. And we started to do cement studies. Because as a pro, uh, as a, first I was trained as a prosthodontist. And uh, like for 10 years, I was only restoring implants. And then we started to make uh, this cement study. And I still remember, like in 2013, I received an email from uh, uh, Stephen Chu from New York. Mm. And uh, he was very known, at least, I mean, of course, everywhere in the world as well in in our country. And he was writing, look, Thomas, I read your study. I I found it uh, very interesting. I I indeed think it the same. So he kind of brought this idea back because it was completely already forgotten in certain way and after that we we started another studies with thickening of the tissues if you have thin tissue then you what the methods to thicken <clears throat> so i remember i told steven this story that he is very much much involved in really this becoming a book and i wrote a thank you acknowledgement in my book for him because, uh, like, uh, I- indeed, it's, it was like that close that none of this would happen. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you a story. Yeah. Gotta uh, tell it, John. This, and, and we put this in the show because I thought I'd pro- it might come up. So this is so crazy that you bring this up. So in 2013, how I oh. discovered <laughs> your studies, I was at an implant conference learning from st- from Chu, learning from Stephen Chu. Oh, okay. And it so was, you know the it, guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And it was the craziest thing because we were at an implant company uh, headquarters mm. and he was supposed to be talking about how to use this implant company's mm-hmm. implant, of course, to, you know, restore. And he makes the statement from the podium. He says, you know, uh, I, I think that all of this design stuff that we're currently talking about may not matter. And this was, of <laughs> course, a very controversial thing to say at this yeah. at the implant company. And I just I had the opportunity to go to dinner with him and a few other people, not just me, but a few other people that night. And I said, okay, hold on, hold on. Tell me about it. and he said, you know, I there's a there's a guy <laughs> in Lithuania <laughs> who's doing some right. studies. And he, he, yeah. And he emailed me the, some, a couple of the papers and I started reading and he said, it's changing the way I'm thinking about, uh, situations. And he go, and he told everyone the second day of that course, he said, I want you to go back to your practice and I want you to look at these implants that are losing bone. And I want you to look at bite wing radiographs. And I want you to look at if you can see the tissue thickness. I want you to, and he goes, I guarantee you, you will start seeing these things. And he said, we just were never looking at this before. And he said, it's Mm. changing everything about the way that I think. And so it's so funny to hear you tell that he was kind of an inspiration because that was what got us thinking about that. And it's a real disruption to the implant industry. I wonder if you could speak to that as to how, how was that received as this information started getting out there? Um, because it doesn't really as much, it, it, it's hard as an, if if you're an implant manufacturer and you hear that these things might not matter, you know, Mm -hmm. what, how is that received? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, of course it's, um, uh, we, cannot really say that it doesn't matter because of course Mm -hmm. uh, all implant design matters uh, but implant design must be put in the context and context Mm. is biology so when you say like just blank uh, blank statement like conical connection is the most important 
Well, it depends on what kind of situation you are talking. So, because if you are talking about suprarenally placed implant, like up to two millimeters below the bone, then I think connection is really important, probably the most important. But if you're talking about the tissue level implant placed one millimeter above the bone with completely like external connection or let's say simple internal connection of the 45 degrees, then the stability, connection stability becomes not important because it's above the bone and all the movements are above the bone. And if you have thick tissues in that kind of situation, so you will have bone stability. But I think that it's good timing because uh, finally companies really understood that the education must be really drawn probably to the other side. And I now really don't hear the statements like, you know, at least let's say official or like this is like our connection is the best or our platform switching is the best. So it's kind of, uh, I think doctors are already um, educated enough to understand that this is the complex issue. And um, uh, I, I see a lot of companies really saying, for example, I, I, I lectured for some companies and I said, look, but I don't have like any slide of your <laughs> to show. Say so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You just talk about the concept and people will get it. And, and, and the, so I had it like with, with several companies, I did that. And I, I standing and saying, look, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm speaking completely independent here. You will, you will see a lot of different brands in my x-rays, but the message is, is, is like this. So I think it's kind of a little bit adapting and uh, probably now even what would not be a, I don't know, I feel kind of like a bad tone to say, like to start to push like 20 years ago, then it was like, you know, oh, this is the magic implant. It goes mm -hmm. and it, you never lose the bone. Mm -hmm. I, I think these days are already the past and uh, we will not return to that. But uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that we noticed is that in different countries that the book is published in, as far as in America, there's one implant design that's featured on the cover. But yeah. um, in other countries, there are other implants featured on the cover. And, and I really yeah. appreciated well, that yeah. um, because what that... What that helps you to understand from a reader's perspective is that there's not one, see, yes, yeah. there's yeah. not one implant that you're favoring. You're really implant agnostic, but your mm -hmm. design choice, right? And and what you have in your toolbox to understand what design features influence my surgery. Maybe you mm -hmm. could speak exactly. to some basic basic design features that we should look for in an implant. I know that's a, a wide subject because there's several chapters just on on that. But yes. what are some basic features today, knowing that we're doing a lot of immediates and we're doing a lot of you know full arch treatment, and um, what what can we look for in, in implant design? Yeah. So. Uh, uh Let's then talk about the implant, which is like on the cover here. Yeah. So uh, this one, and uh, it's uh, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the uh, qualities or design features depends on how the implant will be used. So we here we have a, a platform switching <laughs> implant with conical connection. Uh, and no polished surface. So I think for sucrestally placed implant, this is three major things should be incorporated into the design. So first of all, uh, um, conical connection, and conical connection no more than 20 degrees. Because if you look at mm. uh, different implants, they have different conical connections. So again, just saying, is conical connection important? The question is, 
what kind of conical connection because we mm-hmm. can have like a conical connection from 5 degrees to 45 degrees so again it's a huge distance yeah so i think it should be like up to 20 degrees and that kind of implant can be placed subcrestally uh, or at the level of the bone meaning that mm-hmm. the movement which are always present, will not really harm the bone. And especially if we're placing immediate, immediate cases, we are always suppressed. We're mm-hmm. deep suppressed. And it's better in immediate cases to be more deep than more shallow because we can solve the deepness of implant. I mean, with, there are different things. But if the implant is placed too shallow, then it's a real problem. And sometimes you need even to remove the implant because you don't have emergence profile, mm. and that's all. So conical connection, a platform switching, again, for the bone, and third requisite is polished neck. I really believe that polished neck is actually a feature, if we're talking about bone level implants, from the past, because in the past, all implants had polished neck, and doctors were advised to place them at the level of the bone, meaning that the polished neck goes below the bone and it resorbs. And then uh, people were saying, oh, look, wow, how good that we have polished neck. Now it's resorbed and it's not rough surface, which will be open. Imagine if we had a rough surface. So my answer is that it's like pr- predicting yourself a failure. So don't place that <laughs> implant with polished neck below the bone, and you won't have that bone resorption. So <laughs> right. it's, it's like that. Right, exactly. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If How you, many times yeah, we say that exactly. always, John? <laughs> yeah, we will always have a guarantee of bone. So, so let me, before we move on, because that's such a, uh, it's such a, I don't know, it shouldn't be controversial. And yet we see even now new implant designs coming out where there is a a polished bevel or a polished Mm. collar. Um, And you will hear you will hear people say that the reason for that is because if we lose that bone, if right is always the if we lose that bone and we develop a peri implantitis situation, here we go, that that's a cleansable more cleansable surface. <laughs> so how do you respond to that? Because we hear that a lot. I respond to this. Like, if you can clean your implant neck, so your implant is dead. <laughs> Be- <laughs> <laughs> because you, you should, That's great. You should not clean that surface because it, it's protected by the tissue. So if you have tissue adherence or adhesion or... Yeah how we call it, it's, it's another issue. So if you can clean the surface with a brush, it's over because it means mm. it was already exposed. Mm. I never want to clean my polished neck implant surface because if I cannot clean, it means that it's in the bone, it, it's in the tissue, it's uh, glued to the surface and that's all. So again, this is just, you know, a uh, repeatable phrase which sounds logical but it's not logic because mm-hmm. uh, sure we assume that if it's smooth we will clean it better we like we we all imagining some smooth car yeah like you know with smooth surface and we can clean it and imagine the the surface of the car is rough it's more difficult so that's analogy we connect implant but uh, but 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 it's not like that. We can discuss maybe the influence of rough and smooth surface on the tissues. That's another topic. Yeah, that's maybe would be more correctly to discuss, but not for cleansability. I mean, it's it's nonsense. It's just not understanding. I mean, what's happening? There seems not like. And you know, there seems like there's still a lot of disconnect between different methods of trying to treat periimplantitis and we'll not get into that but it it seems like there's the, we're chasing something here when really what the book talks about is 
let's prevent the bone loss so we don't have to Mm -hmm. treat (coughs) periimplantitis because I think we're a long ways from being able to be able to successfully predictably come up with some protocol to treat periimplantitis with rough and surfaced implants and even polished Mm -hmm. surfaces. I mean, we see case studies on that, but your book speaks to, hey, let's not go to periimplantitis, right? Yeah, the best treatment is prevention. You know, like uh, Mm. it's it's best treatment, no treatment, is prevention. Uh, But uh, let's say in my own experience, the biggest uh, steps in preventing preimplantitis were actually prosthetic things, not implant Mm. design things and not, let's say, implant surgery. Although I'm saying this is as equally as important as prosthetics, but let's say my experience. I had two big s- switches in my practice. So first one was when I switched from cement to screw restorations. So like in f- after graduation for five, six years, I was only semantic restorations and uh, saying, oh, this is so easy, great. I mean, you don't need to prep the tooth and the technician is doing everything. But then we had a really a lot of problems. Like every week, I remember, every week there was something like with a fistula, with some bleeding, with something. So then we did, did these cement studies. Actually, those were initiated by my own poor experience. So I, I kind of took my bad work, yeah, <laughs> made a studies mm-hmm. and turned it, <laughs> turned it into something good. Uh, mm. And so that one, the next and the next thing was switching from glazed surfaces from metal ceramic to zirconia below the tissues. And now, I mean, I can I don't know put my hand on on my heart. People don't believe, but I don't really remember when I had implantitis of this recent. Cases. I mean, when according when the implant is placed in a good position, according to design, when you have thick tissues and it's retained and zirconia below the tissues, hmm. just don't run into the problem. Let me let me ask a uh, back to this design because this is such a again a common thing we are hearing. Um, I had a great question the other day from somebody that knew we were going to be having you on the show, and the and the question was given abundant bone and abundant tissue in the posterior. Um, We know that based upon the book and the studies that are in that book, that you can go the direction of a bone level implant, as you said, with a conical connection, with platform shifting, um, rough and surface, or you could go the direction of a tissue level implant with the understanding that you're placing the polished collar into the tissue area. Um, yes. Can you discuss why you might choose one approach over the other? If if you're if a clinician's trying to decide, you know how many, essentially people are asking the question: How many implants do I need to have in my armamentarium? Mm. You know, do I need to have multiple designs available? And when would I choose tissue level over bone level? If if you assuming that the tissue conditions and bone conditions are are good. Yeah. So uh, the answer would be here that uh, my preference would be bone level, uh, but purely from prosthetic point of view, because as a prosthodontist, I like to have freedom how I restore. Let's say you have a high bone, wide bone, and you don't need to don't need to let's say make compromise because, for example, if you have like not available bone, so let's say Strauman uh, short implants has only uh, only tissue level uh, 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 as a tissue level, so you must use those in those situations. But if put that all aside, uh, I like the, uh, the the feeling that I can control my position of the uh, of the prosthetic margin. And with tissue level, I cannot do that because it's already predetermined. So you have the neck and you cannot get away from it. And again, this is my personal view. I'm not saying that, you know, if those who are using tissue level are some kind of, you know, 
doing not the best. What's if it works? If you don't have any perimplantitis or, or cement related tissues, you're doing so retained. So keep 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 doing that. But uh, if you have those issues, then you probably will, should look that. Uh, because I really think that you can control bone stability around bone level implant by choosing a right uh, uh, titanium base height, by choosing uh, polished zirconia, because actually we have proof now that to say that zirconia is better material than titanium for the tissues. Now, does it always it translate to the bone stability? No, such data is not yet published, but we can really say that for the tissues, for the soft tissues, meaning pink aesthetic score, probing depths, uh, and bleeding on probing, zirconia is better compared to titanium. So um, that that would be my my answer. You know, the one mm-hmm. thing that I think that it is true. And the way you speak about zero bone loss concepts, even on the show today is that there's a marriage between what you're doing surgically and what you're doing restoratively. And that contributes to the factor of zero bone loss concepts. And it's a multiple variables. And one thing that I'd like for you to speak on, and you made this, you made this um, comment in the book that the best, um, I don't know that you said the best, but in, in my confirmation bias, right. My (laughs) confirmation bias would be that the best implant outcomes come with someone that has a true understanding of what's possible restoratively. And I think that's a connection that's really started to start to take off a little bit here in, in our area is that understanding that restoratively it helps to drive our surgeries. And, you know, we, we think, well, that's been around for years. Well, honestly, it hasn't because in up until 2015 in the United States, um, oral surgeons and periodontists placed most of the implants. Now that that's contrasting to most of the world, most of the world, most dentists are trained to place dental implants, but in the U S it was favored up until 2015. Now, uh, restoring doctors in our country are placing more implants on a whole as um, as restoring doctors, they're placing them. And so what I would like you to speak to is like you mentioned this and how does this really help, right? Understanding the restorative aspect. You've already spoken to it some, but how much of an impact does it have? Uh- like uh, the book was released in June 2019, so like almost a year ago. And I really now understand, only now I begin to understand why it really touched so many hearts of people. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons is actually combination of surgery and prosthetics into one book. Because initially, again, you know the story, initially with Quintessence, we were discussing to write two separate books, surgical factors and prosthetics. And now I understand that would be a mistake if we would do that. But like at the end of the day, I was thinking and I made a decision, no, let's, I mean, like from the national point of view, from business point of view, it would be better to have two separate books. And, and, and in total, it would be probably, <laughs> let's say, more financially uh, better to, in terms of, of buying. But uh, I understood that this must come together because if we're talking about that these factors are inseparable, so it must be in one book. How can you then say that they are not separate? You cannot be separate if you publish two different books. So you separate them mm-hmm. already. So that was, I think, <laughs> that was the, the, the good decision which which I made to put it into one. Uh, and to further add, answer your question about, uh, I really believe that, uh, as I wrote in, in I think in 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 in, in like. Um, summary or or at the end of the book 
that uh, a surgeon who does not have, uh, let's say, thinking of prostodontics is difficult to give the best treatment to the patient and vice versa. I gained a more, much more respect for surgical specialty when I started to place the implants myself. Because before that, you know, I was restoring and always complaining, you know, that why is that? Why is that? Now, when you did it yourself, you start to understand that it's not that always easy, but you start to predict your success from the beginning. So mm-hmm. I think that you are a kind of unique situation. You are right that, for example, in, in all of the Europe and also in, in, in Lithuania, in my country, a majority of the implants are placed and, and restored by, by, by same doctors. Of course, difficult cases and these maxillofacial surgeries are done by the, by the, by the surgeons. But uh, here is the trick that sometimes when the, let's say, augmentation is such big, you kind of tend to forget about the small thing as tissue thickness mm-hmm. or small yeah. thing of cement. It doesn't really kind of matter to you because, look, I just rebuilt the bone. It was not possible. And now the patient yep. can have these things go, let's say, to the second row. But at the end of the day, I think they should not, especially then, as I said, you know, my, 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 uh, let's say, what I give is a knowledge. It's, it's actually not a technique. You know, when you go to some course of, of, of surgeon and you do on hands on like, and you really learn the technique. Here are almost no techniques, but like in, well, mm-hmm. vertical augmentation, you have the membrane, which like everybody can do. Mm-hmm. Here is actually synthesis of knowledge and explanation. So I think that it's uh, important. And, and then the, when the surgery, I, I had like in US, uh, several doctors who were placing only implants and, and they start to because it's good for them as well, because let's say you place the implant, the doctor restores it, and then you have preimplantitis. Now, who's to blame? Mm-hmm. Well, the dentist will say, look, the, the implant was bad from the beginning. Mm-hmm. The surgeon will say, oh, you just ruined my work. I gave you like very good implant. Yeah, and yep. there should not be a, a de- detective story here because it's really clear with every step and we can mm-hmm. find the which what happened, but these things now can be really avoided, and uh, and um, there are methods how to how to do it. Yeah, and that was one of the things that, especially as we started um, seeing more of this knowledge coming out, that you know you start mm-hmm. to look at the what all is involved in just a simple quote unquote anterior immediate implant placement and temporization. Um, If you want to do that really well, you have to understand so much of where we're going to end up uh, with the prosthetic result. And not only the three-dimensional placement of the implant, but, um, you know, how do you preserve the tissue that you have and, uh, you know, classify the socket properly and know, understand what your implant design is giving you and what it doesn't have. And, uh, that's one of the things that's, that's got Wes and I into more placement of, of dental implants, even though, you know, we were initially more in the restorative phase, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as you said, you start to respect more, what your surgeons are dealing with for sure. And, uh, in some cases brings you back to, you know, I mean, I sent this book to a couple of my surgeons and said, Hey, you know, this is, um, this is where we need to be heading. Mm -hmm. And it is a challenge though. Yeah. yeah, Together. That's right. It's a challenge because Mm -hmm. in a busy practice, like you say, you just, uh, you know, you just respect, augmented the, this, this huge amount of bone and tissue and look how yeah. nice you this is. And we, yes, that's right. Yeah. And if the implant is, you know, a little bit too high, well, you know, look at all that we accomplished though. And, and yeah, then yeah, the yeah. result, the result is less than perfect. And these are situations where sometimes we get into the pink porcelain discussions and mm-hmm. these, you know, black triangle issues. And, and oftentimes it was, it was just a matter of, of not understanding 
who of, of both teams not understanding what the other what the limitations were uh and i think that this is like you say it's not really a technique book it's just a it's a knowledge book it's an understanding of what's possible yeah and i think it's interesting that um the reason because f- for years many people were very skeptical about immediate implants right and there was a big discussion about whether this would even work and we started seeing these really great outcomes. And I, I think it's interesting now that we look at your book mm-hmm. and we talk about thickness of tissue and we talk about where to ideally place implants. It's interesting to me that that is often where we're replacing our immediate implants, right? Mm-hmm. Is, it, you know, is, is the reason wow. that immediate implants work so well wow. because we were already Deep placing enough. them? Yes. Yes. Speak to that a little bit, because that's something that I think uh, you've kind of found out kind of through the back door, if you will. You know, it's like it wasn't what you were necessarily we were we didn't understand why these things were working until we (laughs) maybe understood the biology. Uh, So I would begin if we discuss immediate implants that, uh, well, when you place the immediate implant, uh, implant does not have biological width. So that first first thing we must understand when if you have healed ridge, you also do not have biological width, yeah, but you have tissues. So you have tissue thickness, you can predict, you can augment, you cannot augment, that yeah, you are in control. While in the immediate implant placement, you have a hole. Yeah? So there was a tooth and tooth is out. So you have a socket, no biological width. No vertical tissue thickness because it does not exist yet. And here we must really differentiate two things. And I kind of started in my book that you have vertical tissue thickness and you also have horizontal tissue thickness. Mm. And that's very crucial because in the anterior case, of course, horizontal tissue thickness, I think, is kind of more important if we would compare to posterior jaw, because in posterior, t- this horizontal tissue thickness, I think it's really does not really play a, a big role. But if I go back to immediate uh, implant case, so your biological width or your vertical protection depends only on one thing, how deep you will place the implant. Because yep. if you place two millimeters below the some below the tissue level, you will have two millimeters. So that's why you I tend to place at least four millimeters from the buccal margin, which mm-hmm. leaves us, of course, more deeper if we compare to interproximal. Yes. But uh, yeah, but in anterior case. Uh, I think yeah, aesthetics and the contour and tissue thickness horizontally, it's 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 it plays. Uh, let's say I would myself would have rather let's say implant with a little bit of bone loss, but good horizontal tissue thickness in anterior uh, case than implant with zero bone loss but like thin horizontal tissues. Yeah. But both yeah. things are here uh, achievable. And as, as I said in my book, we don't need to choose. You can have, yeah, but your implant position depends, it determines, here it really determines your soft tissue height and how your tissues will be height in vertical direction. I think one of the things that you'll learn whenever you start placing implants with respect to <clears throat> hard and soft tissues that you have to use a periodontal probe um, to be able to accurately um, and precisely place these implants. And one of the things that if you're listening to this and you're not, right, uh, not a placer, but you're a restoring doc, one thing I would encourage you to do is go to your surgeon's office. But Because one of the best things that I ever did before I got into placing implants for about five, the first five years of my career, I kind of put that on hold um, until my practice got going is I would go right next door, which I was fortunate enough to have a surgeon next door to me. And he would invited me into the operatory and to help collaborate right on the position of the dental implant with respect to bone and soft tissue. You know, one of the things too, I want us to 
kind of stick with this soft tissue notion here for a minute, Tomas and John, is John and I recently took a course from uh, Dr. Pat Allen, and um, it was on soft tissue augmentation. We primarily took that course because of your research and the fact that mm-hmm. we need to have that in our toolbox, right? To be able mm-hmm. to augment the soft tissue. Mm-hmm. And one thing that he talked yeah. about is that this idea of <clears throat> what you're talking about here is keratinized versus non-keratinized tissue. The mucogingival junction, where that's at in the anterior is so important. And he talked about that as a periodontist, it really doesn't matter if it's keratinized, it matters if mm-hmm. it's dense, fibrous, laid down right. tissue. I want you to speak Not, to that. Yeah. Speak yeah, to sorry, that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, interrupted. But I agree. It must be immobile. Immobile. If it does not mm-hmm. move, then, and again, here I like the analogy. Now let's think about adhesion and how tissues glue to the surface of the restoration. And if it's moving, it means not sufficient uh, tissues. So you will never have this adhesion. And probably even zirconia won't save you if the tissues will be moving. So I look at this area. I agree with Dr. Uh, Beth Allen that this should be fibrous and not mobile. We don't need a keratinization there as a must be. So that really gives you the stability, not mobility. And uh, then is one of the factors uh, which should be. But of course, here again, we uh, must go back to tissue thickness because, and still now, uh, a lot of uh, clinicians tend to mix it together, saying that talking about vertical tissue thickness and having in mind the keratinized tissues or or this part. So vertical tissue thickness and attached tissues are two different factors. Why it's so easy to to mix them or to, because both of them have vertical factor because only crestal tissue thickness or vertical tissue thickness is measured at the top of the crest. While if you go more buccally, you are still having this vertical dimension, but it's already on the buccal or lingual side. So then this is attached or keratinized or immobile tissues. So that's why uh, still up today, people say that, okay, yeah, you, I understand you need thick tissue. So that's why I always do keratinized. And I say, no, we are talking about different areas of mm-hmm. The, of the of the dental is rich because and both of them need to be in certain uh, dimensions and, and what I like I really understood during this lecturing years that we all need numbers and I I, I kind of came up with a with a nice sentence like what is the what is the work or job of scientists scientists must turn the feeling into numbers. Because mm-hmm. everybody has feeling, like you know, I've been doing this for twenty years, and I have feeling that this works or it does not work. Mm-hmm. Okay, you have now translate this feeling to me, like let me feel it. <laughs> right, impossible. Right, but if you say <laughs> two, three, one, okay, and now I understand you. Yeah, so that's exactly. why we need we need numbers in what we yeah. talk about. Dentists like quantification and that you can yeah. quantify implant dentistry. I've, I've, I've taught that for years. You have to, um, if you're yeah. going to use, especially these when you're of, teaching, when you're teaching, if, you're, if you just, if you, the, there's nothing worse than watching an artist, uh, just describe his work as art. I mean, it's great. I love to watch it, but yeah. I can't translate that into that, my practice <clears throat> because it seems impossible. It seems it seems like a black box. And once yeah. you start having numbers, we can, we can have a goal to shoot for. And, and that's what we, we all need or else, it, or else you can't, or else it becomes just uh, an art. And, and that's, uh, mm-hmm. that's not translatable. Yes, and you know, this, uh, from where this, you know, this saying, I, I'm sure you heard it. In the, it works in my hands. 
Yeah, I heard it so many times. I hate now, that, yeah. give me your hand, okay? Give me your hand. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Of course, our specialty, we must have like hands, yeah? Like we should do things. But when we talk about, you know, so how deep, okay, I can tell you one millimeter, two. How tissue yeah. thickness, three millimeters, four. Not, you know, well, you know, I feel that it's already thick enough. So it's, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so to finish up the soft tissue argument, not argument, <clears throat> right? But to finish discussion. up the discussion here yeah. is I think there's a lot of promise um, from what I've been studying and reading and what you presented in the book on allodermous tissue and um, in this grafting um you know, exercise and concept where we need to thicken the tissue when the tissue is not sufficiently thick to be able to place the implant. And you speak of even xenografts and and even Dr. Pat Allen, the reason why we took his course mm -hmm. is because he is using alloderm instead of doing free gingival grafts solely and has been for 20 years, mm -hmm. and which is great for the patient. And I noticed in your book, you're using xenografts, which he talked about a product that will be FDA approved here soon in the United States that he feels like as a xenograft material will replace the alloderm uh, that he's been using for the last 20 years. Speak a little bit about the ability to use these products instead of grafting from the palate and what results you're seeing. We started uh, the study, uh, the, the, the use of, of these uh, soft tissue graft substitutes uh, because I remember when we, we, we discussed with my, my colleague, Algerdas Puishis, who, who is a surgeon and actually he was one of them uh, working in this field. Uh, and I remember we, we talked about, okay, so we have thin tissues. So what do you do about it? Okay, let's graft them. And I remember I looked at one study which actually was using soft tissues from the palate. And I found that they had even more bone loss before the grafting. Later, we, t we really, ex I got an explanation because it happened, not because of grafting, but because of the poor implant position. But I learned mm -hmm. it only later. So that's why we decided, okay, let's go for soft tissue substitutes. And th at that time, uh, the first soft tissue substitute which we're using, it was 2000, I think, 10. It was Alloderm, Alloderm from Horizons. A, a, and we started to use this in two-stage surgeries. A, and later, we switched to xenografts, porcine xenografts, which allow to make this procedure of vertical tissue thickening in one stage. I mean, you can do two-stage always, but... Uh, we all know if alloderm allo gets exposed, it, it becomes really not not nice experience. So that's why we, in one stage surgeries, we do the uh, porcine xenografts. And I think that uh, here we, we must distinct again two types of tissue thickness and regions of the mouth. So I'll start from posterior. Now, if we have posterior and you have thin tissues vertically, and let's say you have some invagination, a little bit of defect on the buccally, so we never, actually never take soft tissue graft. We take a soft tissue substitute and augment it vertically and also horizontally. Now, if we move, of course, to anterior region, then again, uh, probably, again, situation changes a little bit. Then uh, uh, soft tissue grafts from palate uh, done in a good way, depetalized, because if you leave epithelium, that's another challenge, and you might have even more bone loss than you expected, is also in a good option. I think where we still don't have a really good alternative is for it, it, uh, making of attached tissues or immobile tissues. Mm. Here we need still use soft tissue grafts from uh, autogenous grafts to achieve mm. this kind of stability. But 
I don't see, you know, the the war between which is better. I think from the patient side and also from the material side. Let's say, imagine you have really thin tissues and you need to place four implants, like short implants, and you need to graft all of them. So you will cut mm-hmm. all the palate of the patient. And here, the soft tissue substitutes or allografts or xenografts really come to the the service of you, like tissues from the shelf. So I don't see here any, you'd say, uh, like war between them. What we really Mm -hmm. know, that in the aesthetic area, I think soft tissue grafts really are more aesthetic. They uh, will maintain better volume because... Soft tissue substitutes, yeah, we they will at least they will stay the best as we put them. Probably they will shrink a little bit. While tissues, connective tissues, uh, they have tendency a little bit maybe to grow with time. Mm. So mm. that's my position on 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 this part. That's good. Yeah, that's a great kind of clarification <clears throat> to say that you know it's uh we we can't just uh, leave connective tissue grafting in the past. Uh, we need no, to have no. the knowledge for for both techniques, and you know, as we as we kind of are coming to a close, respect your time. I, I think there's another question. One might be maybe final question that has really been kind of goes goes back a little bit to implant design. It's been kind of burning a little bit in uh, for Wes and I, and that has been um, you know you, we we mentioned earlier that if you are uh, looking at implant design, that there are these factors that you would prefer. And then we talked about immediates and the fact that depth is your, your factor. And you said, I think very rightly, of course, that if you want to err on one side, err on the side of being a little deeper, um, because you can have more, yeah, you can control things, uh, in a, in a more positive way. So coming back to implant design and kind of putting that all together, um, there are clinicians that are placing uh, polished collar implants as immediates using that same type of approach. They're placing it, you know, below tissue, below bone, super deep, oftentimes, as you said, interproximally. Um, do you see uh, do you see a, a time? when that is going to work out well. I guess we're, we're seeing this oftentimes in the United States where there's this, I mean, the same approach that you said earlier, as far as the connection becomes incredibly important, the surface becomes incredibly important. Um, you would use the same type of implant design for your anterior immediates, I would guess, that you mentioned earlier. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yes. My comment would, would be here, Again, you know, it depends on uh, how high we raise our success level because mm. it would be false to say that if you place this like immediate implant with polished neck, these implants do not integrate. Yeah, they integrate probably mm-hmm. the same as implants without polished neck. So in terms of implant success or failure, it's probably uh, the same. Uh, but mm-hmm. when you start to measure bone loss, then you obviously see the the, the difference because uh, the I mean, and this was not invented by me. Like the that polished neck does not integrate. It's been old, like you know, like 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 implants, like uh, from thirty years ago. It was already clear. And it's explained that the the stress cannot distribute through this polished part. That's why this is like a passive bone dieback. And uh, and again, I mean, this is kind of philosophical way that, okay, if you can accept this, like this polished neck bone loss, and you don't see the further amount of implant failure, well, it's up to you. But in my opinion, there is a way not to have it. And if it's mm. the way not to have it, so why don't we just do it? And uh, yeah. to have additional two millimeters of bone, I, I think won't harm the patient. <laughs> yeah. And the oral. <laughs> bone is good. Yeah. yeah I'd, I'd say bone that's probably good. the, yeah. uh, <laughs> probably won't harm anybody. That's for sure. <laughs> so I think as we kind of conclude here, 
one of the things I think I saw come across um, my uh, social media feed was something amazing. And Tomas has um, d- is is committed to training people in these ideas of zero bone loss concepts. And we have a short video uh, that we'd like to share with you. And then Tomas is going to comment on the video and, and what is going in behind the scenes on this next level training that you can receive via webinar, mm-hmm. from what I understand, which is amazing. And so I'm going to play mm-hmm. the video and then we're going to bring Tomas back on and talk a little bit about what's went into this and what you can yeah. expect when you take the course. So here we go. Hello. My name is Thomas Linkiewicz and I am excited to announce the first online course of Zero Bone Loss Concept. Yes, you heard it right. Online course, how to develop and how to maintain crystal bone stability. A lot of information is presented in my bestseller and during live courses I do all over the world. However, it's not possible to reach everybody. So guess what? I am bringing zero bone loss concepts right to you. You will be able to study these amazing principles when you want, where you want, and as much as you want. Sounds interesting? Find out more on my webpage and see you online. Whoa. That's all I got to say. The music man. gets me pumped up. That is I got chill bumps up my spine. That's how, uh, you know what? Tomas asked us in the pre-show. She, he was like, do you all miss practicing? Yes. Yes. yes we miss practicing that. I mean, like, we want to me go back there. to work Put and apply in. this stuff, right? Tomas, yeah, so talk tell- about how can people yeah. connect with that? You know, how can they get involved if they want to, uh, they want to uh, take that training? Yeah, so to, first of all, they need to go to my website, uh, thomaslinkavichus.com. And uh, uh, we're still now uh, in the process of like finishing for small some details. So the course is not available yet. However, they can register and they will get notification right away to their email with a link uh, when they will could, could start learning. I had this idea in general, like uh, for some time, because when you you travel, when you speak, when you make courses, you know, there's always this, you know, distance because, uh, of course, it matters. I mean, let's say you have some 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 problem, but if, oh, for you to take out, let's say, three or four days out of your practice or to travel and to 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 uh, hotel stay away from your friends and family i mean these things sometimes uh, let people say okay oh, well okay maybe I'll, 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 I'll i don't need that anymore so that i had idea to to really bring this uh, to 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 your to your desktop or to to your screens and the the course is uh, actually uh, really very similar, almost identical to I do live course, like uh, when, when, when people really come to the course. We have uh, 10 lectures, so practical, uh, theoretical part, five lectures in surgery, five lectures in prosthetics. And then we have two hands-on sessions when I really explain here more than I do in my hands-on course where I usually show one of the techniques to how I meant vertical tissue thickness. So here I put all four of them, how to augment tissues vertically, so they can see on the a, on a animal model everything very precisely. Also, I had this idea, okay, so what's, I mean, what could be missing between uh, me sitting at home, yeah, and somebody watching video online? So, of course, this possibility to ask the question. So we incorporate it into software like you can ask any question anytime you want. So you're watching something, okay, you have the question, you type it. Of course, you know, I probably won't be able to answer it right away uh, as I would do on the live course. 
But I assure you, I receive all these emails and, and, and then we answer them. And then finally, you, of course, will get your answer. Of course, also all the papers published, all hand on, hands-on sessions, uh, handouts will, will be available as well. So I kind of really, really excited. It, I, I worked, you know, we worked like for two months to get this thing yeah. together. And it won't be like, you know, just, you know, standing me there in the, the screen and somebody's filled me with like an old camera, you know, when, <laughs> you know, you thought maybe on this promo, it will be really interactive. I will mm. be like, you know, discussing very nice pictures and the, uh, uh, I think it's, you know, when I watched all this, everything connected together, I said, okay, finally, I understand it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so I think good. that, you know, you're, you're obviously, uh, one thing I've appreciated about your approach, and this comes through in the book, is um, it's modern, you know, and I think, you know, Wes and I talk about this so much that, you know, we need to understand where we were 20 years ago in order to understand mm -hmm. where we are today, mm -hmm. but new new approaches uh, can be done better, not only in <clears throat> the way the book is written, but in the way we teach. And I think that's no more appropriate than today when we're all, you know, in the last couple of months, there's been a ton of innovation yeah. happening yeah. with learning. And it's exciting. I mean, and you're obviously taking advantage of some of that and in incorporating the idea that you could, you know, ask a question during the presentation and then have that question followed up on later yeah. that's as, yeah, really cool. it's as close as it gets to being there you know in a live uh setting it's kind of a combination of the live course and you know watch on demand and i and i can tell from the promo that like you said it's it's going to be a modern approach mm -hmm. even to the presentation so i'm excited about that i think that's going to be something that a lot of people are going to tap into who have either heard this or have read the book and want to really see more of the hands-on, at least watch so how some of these things, because uh, many many of us are visual in the way that we learn. Yeah. And so seeing some of these things done is huge. Mm. And of course, it's like, what, what, what I like about it is that you can, you know, uh, as they said in the promo, that you can watch it where you want, as much as you want, and I mean, it can repeat it, and you would be just, you know, you, you're, you can have this lecture all 24-7, and it's sometimes yeah. really good because uh, you kind of tend to forget things, you know, that you, I actually, I, I receive after people come to my course, I, do you answer them and suddenly after two months I see the email from the person I remember asking the question and he's asking the same question because he maybe you know yeah. he didn't put it down or forgot or so these videos online course will give you like you know I think a better better in-depth understanding of the of zero bone loss concept. Yeah. Well, we're, awesome. we're excited for this coming out. I think it's going to be a great resource. And uh, so definitely go check out the website, as he mentioned, and get in line uh, for when the uh, course be, uh, comes available. Um, we're going to be having yeah. another show tomorrow. I uh, just want to give you a little, we haven't really talked about this, but we've got a couple of folks coming on from Spear Education, who's one of the, you know, the big uh, dental education providers here in the U.S., who's going to be, we're going to be talking to uh, Greg Kinzer and Bob Winter about some of the prosthetic concepts uh, from the book. So uh, those who are watching right now and uh, kind of are finding this to be useful, you know, join us again tomorrow uh, and, and we'll be talking some more about kind of what this changes about how do you communicate to your lab, for instance, on you know, polishing zirconia and, and tie based mm -hmm. design. And, you know, these are going to be some high level clinicians that are going to be kind of unpacking the communication side of it even more, uh, because this is, this is having just wide ranging impacts on our, on our profession. And so we really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, and it's I been an awesome you. time. I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that, that it makes, that makes our whole, I'll drink yeah. to that. Yeah, hopefully, like, you know, when all this thing will be over, I will come to U.S. and uh, let's let's meet somewhere and oh, have a beer. Love it.
<laughs> yes, yeah. That, sign me up for that for sure. Or we, or maybe one day we can come and check your your place yeah. out too. That would be pretty be pretty amazing. amazing. Uh, it's a place we haven't been before, and we'd love to check it out. Yeah, so if you've been listening to this, yeah, yeah, that's what I would imagine. Yeah. So if you if you've enjoyed this, if this has brought value to your daily practice, to your uh, learning, uh, give us some feedback on that. Uh, of course, uh, give. Uh, Tomas some feedback as well and get involved with him, but uh, let us know what you thought. Leave us uh, some comments, some feedback, and uh, really importantly too, reviews are, are super helpful for us. If you go to Apple Podcasts, uh, yeah, this of course will be re-released as an audio and video uh, in the coming weeks, uh, so you'll be able to go back and re-listen through this if you like. Uh, those reviews are super helpful to get our message out and let people know what we're doing and what we're up to uh, at the Dental Guys. And uh, you know, let us know if you want more content like this. This is the kind of thing we're passionate about, as you guys know, is bringing you uh, the highest level that we can get of uh, the clinicians and the research and the data and translink that into your practice to where it makes an immediate impact. So we appreciate everybody joining us from around the world. We've had people from all over the world checking in with us on this live stream today. Uh, it's great to see that international audience. Obviously, this book has had an international impact, and we're very, very uh, honored to uh, have Tomas on the show today. So for Tomas, for Wes, I'm John, and this has been a great episode of The Dental Guys. 